Good morning, everyone. We have, uh, <clears throat> we have several things to cover today, including our full vaccination schedule, as well as a small change in guidance. But first, today, March 19th, marks the one-year anniversary of Vermont's first confirmed deaths from COVID-19. Unfortunately, in the year since, we've lost 217 fellow Vermonters and over 538,000 fellow Americans. And these aren't just numbers. Each represents a human being with families and friends who loved and cared about them. Every one of them, in their own way, made a mark on those around them and in their communities. While the commitment and dedication of all Vermonters has kept fatalities lower than any other state in the nation, I know how tightly knit our communities are and that a single loss can have a huge impact. Since those first two deaths, I've ordered flags to fly at half staff on the 19th of every month in honor of those we've lost. On this solemn anniversary, I've done so again. And I've also asked churches, schools, municipalities, and others to ring their bells 14 times at 7 p.m. tonight to honor those we've lost and the loved ones they've left behind in all 14 counties of our state. As we mourn, we can also be optimistic about the road ahead while doing what we can to prevent this level of loss in the future. As I've said before, just one year ago, no one thought we'd have these three highly effective vaccines to protect ourselves today. And we're making great progress as of this morning. 30% of Vermonters, of Vermont adults, have received at least one dose. This includes over 80% of those over the age of 70 and those over 16 with certain high-risk conditions. That means before long, the vast majority of those most at risk of severe illness and death will be protected. And today, I'm also outlining the remaining schedule for when every Vermonter, 16 and over, will be able to sign up to be vaccinated. As we've discussed, we're going back to our age banding strategy, which was successful because we know age is the top risk factor and because it's the most efficient and fastest way for us to get shots in arms. So beginning Thursday, March 25th, we'll move to all Vermonters age 60 and over. Then on Monday, March 29th, we'll go to 50 plus. One week later, April 5th, all those over 40 and older. And on April 12th, those 30 and over will be eligible. Finally, on April 19th, one month from today, anyone above the age of 16 will be able to schedule their vaccination. Now, I want to repeat this. By April 19th, every single adult Vermont, Vermonter, will be able to schedule their appointment. Now, to be clear, these are the dates folks will be able to sign up. It doesn't mean everyone will be fully vaccinated by them. When a new age ban opens, appointments should be available within two to three weeks. And again, depending on which vaccine you receive, it takes a while before you're fully vaccinated. So as a reminder, fully vaccinated means two weeks after your last dose. A good way to think about it is that everyone uh, in each age band will have had the opportunity to be fully vaccinated about two months after their band opens up. So everyone in the final age band could be finished in June, which is why I've used the 4th of July when I believe things will feel somewhat normal again. And by the way, normal to me isn't a small cookout in your backyard with a couple of friends. It's when things will feel similar to pre-pandemic. To put a finer point on it for our high school seniors, this timeline means that in June, if we have the vaccination uptake we need and we have the supply, you should be able to have a more traditional graduation. 
and celebrate what you've accomplished with your friends and family. After seeing the second half of your junior year and now senior year turned upside down, you deserve it. And we're going to do everything we can to make it happen. As we vaccinate more Vermonters, we'll also be able to turn the spigot a bit more often. We've done so recently, allowing travel and gatherings for those who are vaccinated, and also allowing two non-vaccinated households get together. Last week, we updated our restaurant guidance to allow for six people per table. An effective Wednesday, March 24th, bars and clubs like the VFW or American Legion or Elks will fall under the restaurant guidance. This means they can open under the restaurant guidance as long as they follow the capacity limits we have in place. Distancing is observed. Everyone is seated at tables and all other restaurant guidance is followed. There is a caveat, however. Municipalities, by actioning, uh, action of their governing body, will be able to take stricter action if they so choose. And as I've said, <clears throat> in the next two to three weeks, I'll outline uh, our plan for emerging from the pandemic and how we'll return to normal by the 4th of July. Well, I'm sure this is welcome news to most. I want to remind everyone. It's more important than ever to follow the health, uh, health guidance. Wear a mask, keep your distance, stay home when sick, and continue to get tested so we can stop the spread of the virus in its tracks. While we're in the last few laps of this race, we've got to remember, we're still in the race. So a lot can happen. So we've got to stay united in order to get through this with the fewest lives lost and emerge stronger than we were before. In a few minutes, Secretary Smith will go into further detail about vaccines. But first, I'm going to turn it over to Deputy Secretary Heather Boucher of the Agency of Education to provide our weekly education update. Heather. Thank you, Governor. Good morning. My remarks today will largely focus on two areas, an update on our COVID education recovery planning and highlighting the significant federal funding for recovery available to our education system. But first, I'll start with a quick update on surveillance testing. As of 8 a.m. this morning, 1,314 have been tested, four are positive. This is a positivity rate of 0.31%, and the state positivity rate is 1.3%. With respect to education recovery, recall that we are requiring school districts to assess student need and develop plans addressing that need in three areas, social emotional functioning, mental health and wellness, engagement and truancy, and academic achievement and success. Each of these areas is of critical importance. None is a higher priority than the others. They're all equally important to supporting our students. The breadth of these topics means that districts will need to partner with other community and regional organizations to adequately meet student needs in the weeks and months ahead. Earlier this week, districts submitted their membership rosters for recovery planning teams, and I'd like to highlight a couple of them who are adopting creative approaches. In St. Albans, Maple Run School District is including a social worker, early childhood representative, and a representative from the local Division of Child and Family Services, in addition to teachers, special education directors, school counselors, and other core district and school staff in their planning work. Franklin Northeast Supervisory Union includes representation from their regional designated agency providing mental health services, as well as their regional CTE, Career Technical Education, center, parents, and community members. Still others will be working with pediatricians, equity coordinators, data analysts, social emotional learning specialists, and private clinicians in collaborative cross-sector approaches that promise to leverage the best thinking and therefore the best immediate and long-term outcomes for our students. And we're excited about this response because we know it's going to take a community-wide approach to fully mitigate the impact of COVID on students. 
To turn towards how we'll pay for recovery efforts, I'll now provide some information on the significant federal dollars that both districts and the state agency will leverage to support recovery. And here I'm referring to three allocations of funding under the Elementary and Secondary School Emergency Relief Fund, or ESSER, uh, which is part of the three consecutive federal COVID relief bills that you're likely aware of. All told, school districts will receive over $398 million in federal funds in Vermont to be spent over the next three years on the following. Summer programming, including initiatives to address learning loss, expanded after school and extended learning opportunities, mental health services, infrastructural changes such as ventilation, construction, and the like needed to address the pandemic and recovery efforts, technology upgrades and equipment, and any activities that would be regularly funded through title dollars, providing supports to historically marginalized students, Perkins dollars to support CTE, and other existing federal programs that support education. In addition, approximately 44 million ESSER dollars are allocated to the Agency of Education to address emergency needs as determined by the state agency resulting from COVID-19. Some guiding principles for this funding are uh, that they're one-time funds and they should be really used in a strategic manner. Uh, the funds should certainly be focused on education recovery because that's the um, overall uh, funding uh, goal and source of the funds. And the recovery work in education is going to take some time and that's why the funds extend out into 2023 accordingly. AOE strategic recovery priorities for this funding include improving school facilities, including indoor air quality and other health and safety issues, supporting integrated service delivery models in all regions, and addressing learning loss through expanded capacity for remote learning. And finally, echoing what Governor Scott said, I'd like to wrap up with a message of gratitude for the hard work and collaboration educators and their partners have participated in this past year, as well as hope for what lies ahead. We're looking forward to summer in particular as a time of reconnection, replenishment, and above all fun for students and adults alike. We've earned it. Thank you, and I will turn the podium now to Secretary Smith. Thank you, Deputy Secretary. Good morning, everyone. Once again, we'll cover a lot of ground on the vaccine front today. As Governor Scott announced, the vaccine registration schedule has been established for all remaining age groups. We will rapidly move through these age groups, which may surprise many Vermonters. Of course, this schedule relies on a steady and increasing supply of vaccine from the federal government but it aligns with what we have been told is our vaccine allocation from the White House. I'll start off with the details for the group opening next week. After that, I will provide an update on our vaccination program. As the governor had mentioned, starting next week, Thursday, March 25th, we will begin registration for those 60 years old and older. We ask that you create an account ahead of time by going to healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. When registration opens, all you need to do is sign into your account and make an appointment on March 25th. You can register again online at healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. This is the preferred method. Or you can call 855-722 7878 if you're unable to sign up online. Please remember, and we wish to emphasize this, as the governor did, that the date registration opens for your age group is the date you are eligible to be vac vaccinated. It will take uh, some time to be fully vaccinated. It will be approximately two months from the time you register to the time of your first and last dose appointments and you will not be considered fully vaccinated until two weeks after your last dose. This is the, the goal is to have all Vermonters vaccinated by July 1st. In terms of our overall progress, 
As of this morning, 166,100 people have been vaccinated against COVID-19. 77,300 have received their first dose of vaccine. 88,800 have received their first and last dose of vaccine. Again, some of the statistics that the governor had, had mentioned that are really impressive. 85% of those 75 years old and older have been, vaccina have been vaccinated. 83% of those 70 to 75 year olds have been vaccinated. And nearly 60% of those 65 to 69 have been vaccinated. As you remember, 90, over 90% of our deaths have occurred with those in those categories that are 65 and above in terms of age. Turning to educator clinics, 11,000 people have been vaccinated in those educator clinics and 7,300 people have made appointments for vaccination. So 18,300 educators and eligible childcare providers have received a first dose or have made an appointment uh, for those first dose. Next uh, week, we'll, we will have limited uh, Johnson & Johnson allocation. This was predicted. And we have noticed that uh, educator clinics have not been filling up. As a result, we will have fewer vaccine clinics for educators for next week only. We anticipate we will receive more doses of Johnson & Johnson in the following week, and we will ramp up uh, vaccination for educators again the week of March 29th. If you have not done so already, I encourage all educators and eligible child care providers to make appointments. We will uh, complete this group uh, in the middle of April as we had originally planned. So here are the educator clinics that haven't filled. Next week's appointments are still available, and there are quite a, bit, uh, quite a few slots in Hyde Park, St. Albans, Grand Isle, and Hartford. Um, I just want to mention on our community vaccination clinics, next week we'll have 91 open clinics located across the state. Uh, next week, the clinic, the clinic in St. Albans on March 26, um, we have 130 appointments that are available there as well. Corrections, just to give an update on corrections, right now 77 in-state Vermont incarcerated individuals have been vaccinated with at least one dose of vaccine next week. Approximately 90 individuals are scheduled. 78 Vermont incarcerated individuals in Mississippi have been vaccinated, and we are working with a core civic to make sure that all Vermont incarcerated individuals in Mississippi are vaccinated. We anticipate that any inmate who wants to be vaccinated will have at least one dose of vaccine by the end of April. All of this will mean that, it, what's this all mean? Well, it means that if we continue to see steady increasing supply of vaccine, we feel confident we will achieve the goal of offering vaccine to all Vermonters 16 and above by July 1st. This is incredibly exciting news, but I want to remind everyone that it may again take up to two months after your age group is eligible for you to be considered fully vaccinated. It, I want to encourage everyone uh, to create account, an account ahead of time at healthvermont.gov slash my vaccine so you're ready to make an appointment when it is your turn to make to um, to get vaccinated as you can see on the on the chart here we have a very accelerated uh, vaccination schedule so please make your appointment uh, as soon as please register on this site as soon as possible and then when your age band becomes available you can simply go on to the, to the website and schedule an appointment. Has been an incredible year, and throughout this tough, difficult time, I'm just proud to be a Vermonter. Vermonters all across the state can be proud of how they responded to the pandemic. 
Vermont has consistently been one of the safest states to live in throughout this pandemic. That is a result of Vermonters coming together and doing the right thing, masking, staying six feet apart, washing hands, staying home with sick when they're sick, and avoiding crowds. I want to applaud Vermonters for where we are today, for all that you have done, because we couldn't have accomplished what we're doing now without all of Vermonters participating. And the vaccination plan uh, that we're releasing today is a result of that effort that Vermonters have put forward. We should be back to normal by July, uh, by the 4th of July, as the governor had said. And I just want to say one more time, thank you. I will now turn it over to Dr. Levine for a health update. Thank you and good morning. Our cases are still within the expected range this week, anywhere from the 50s to the 130s on a given day. There are currently 22 people in the hospital with COVID-19, five in the ICU. These are some of the lowest numbers we've seen in many weeks. There are no additional deaths and the numbers and rate of deaths continue to be decreased with March now two-thirds over. Again, clear testimony to the success of our current vaccination strategy. As many, including the governor, have noted, today marks the one-year mark of our first deaths in Vermont due to COVID-19. I recall standing in the lobby of the health department with the governor for that somber media briefing. We all, as a state, felt those losses very deeply. Many in the state were scared and worried as the devastating impact of this virus truly sunk in and became a reality for us all. We knew this virus spread quickly and that some of our most vulnerable were at risk, but we certainly could not predict the toll that COVID-19 would take. And there we stood, maskless, in a crowded lobby, reporters in person across from us, we knew so little about this virus, had so little testing capacity, had this new evidence of how profound an impact it could have had on our entire state. Since that day in 2020, we've lost a total of 217 Vermonters. But I hope we can reflect today not on the number, but on the people whose lives ended too soon. Our hearts go out to their families and loved ones who live with this loss every day. Now I'd like to also share more about our progress in providing vaccination opportunities for Vermonters who are black, indigenous, and people of color. As I've mentioned before, our data shows that Vermonters who identify as BIPOC are overrepresented in COVID-19 cases and have significantly higher hospitalization and chronic disease rates relative to white, non-Hispanic people with COVID-19. We've been working with community partners in Burlington, Brattleboro, and other parts of Vermont to ensure access and provide and prioritize the equitable vaccination of BIPOC Vermonters. We've now organized the first of these specific clinics that allow a person who identifies as BIPOC and meets current state eligibility guidelines to be vaccinated with the rest of their household. So currently, that means one household member must be age 65 or older or age 16 or older with a high risk health condition. We now have 262 BIPOC Vermonters scheduled for a clinic in Burlington tomorrow in partnership with the Racial Justice Alliance and the City of Burlington. Another 100 people are scheduled for a clinic in Wyndham County in Brattleboro next week, thanks to our partner, the NAACP. These clinics are currently full. We have already vaccinated 70 migrant farm workers in Addison County on Wednesday in partnership with the Open Door Clinic. You recall that these clinics are similar to those held for English language learners 
and those connected to the refugee and immigrant communities. Those clinics have now provided 678 first doses and 339 second doses for these communities. These clinics continue weekly and vaccinate in the range of 100 people per week. Our partners there include the Association of Africans Living in Vermont and the U.S. Committee for Refugees and Immigrants of Vermont. You can find more information about these clinics on our website, healthvermont.gov slash myvaccine. We continue to plan for additional clinics and will share new information as we have it. We must continue and extend the pace of vaccination. We know we have much yet to do. All of the efforts I've just described will continue in the light of the uh, future vaccination timeline that you've seen here. A huge thank you to all of our partners in these efforts. They are so critical, so committed, so enthusiastic, and so instrumental to the success of this initiative. We still have much more to do to address historical harms and the resulting mistrust of health care and public health. But these are important steps forward in making sure that BIPOC communities get the support they need in the language they need, in the locations they need to make informed choices and to get scheduled for vaccinations. Finally, I do want to acknowledge that we have gotten some good news today, learning when we will all be eligible to get the vaccine. I know for many, they have been anxious, but now excited for their turn to get vaccinated. But remember that we're still in a race against this virus and it's changing all the while. We announced yesterday that Vermont now had two of what the CDC calls variants of concern. We first found the B117 variant, which originated in the United Kingdom and now have found it in eight specimens. More recent lab results now show the B1429 strain first identified in California. We have found the newer variant in three specimens. This variant is thought to be 20% more transmissible. Recall that the B117 is considered to be 40 to 50% more transmissible. These detections were found in samples from both Chitton and Franklin counties, where we already know we are seeing an increase in COVID-19 cases. Now, viruses change constantly, so this is expected, but these variants are more transmissible. And that means we really need to keep up prevention until more of us can be vaccinated. Wearing a mask, staying six feet apart, and gathering safely are really critical right now. There has been of late a stalling in the dramatic decreases in new cases of COVID around the country, but especially in the Northeast. The two most likely reasons for this are a relaxation in following these simple precautions and the spread of the variant strains. Please keep the following in mind, something I've said many times over the winter. Everyone is going to enjoy more freedoms as the spring and summer unfold, and this will be wonderful indeed. But to fully enjoy them and to really find our way out of this pandemic, we must, on a parallel course, continue to follow the simple guidance of masks and distancing and cautious travel, along with getting registered for vaccination as soon as your age band opens up. And please, get tested, especially if you're having symptoms of any kind, even a headache, cough, fatigue, or a runny nose. And stay home and away from work, school, or other events until you get a negative test result. I am actually hearing stories from our interviews of cases that indicate people have at times assumed they had a cold or a sinus infection instead of first thinking they might have COVID during this time of an ongoing pandemic. So let my words be a reminder that in spite of vaccination becoming a truly wonderful and long awaited reality, the pandemic has yet to disappear. 
This is the only way for us all to stay ahead in the race. If we can use our prevention and testing tools and get vaccinated as soon as it's our turn, we can achieve a level of community immunity that will bring us all out of this pandemic. We can cross the public health finish line sooner together. Governor Scott. Thank you, Commissioner Levine. We'll now open it up to questions. Um, thanks, Governor. So how many vaccines are you expecting to get each week um, that would make this accelerated timeline of vaccinating Vermonters possible? Yeah, I don't have that right in front of me, uh, but uh, we expect to continue to get the allocation of the Moderna and Pfizer as we have uh, over uh, the last uh, few weeks. Uh, and continue to get that supply. The uptick will be in the Johnson & Johnson in particular, but they are anticipating increased supplies in the other as well. So um, every single week, as you know, uh, we have this uh, conversation with the White House, with the National Governors Association, all the governors on the call, and uh, they give us a three-week window. They're hoping to give us a little bit further uh, look into the future uh, next week uh, into what what could happen uh, throughout April. So we're confident with what they've told us, uh, and we believe you know we'll be able to meet meet. Uh, we wouldn't be uh, putting this out if we didn't think we could make it. Uh, obviously, uh, we've been able to uh, accomplish everything that we've we've told you. I think to date, and uh, we have no reason to believe that we won't in the future. Um, just a clarifying point: How many people are in each of these age bands? We, it's on the website, um, and we didn't. Uh, we decided not to include it in this uh, graphic, but we do have it on the website, uh, and we can. Uh, you, I think you, it'd be easier for you to look there. Um, but it's a. Uh, it takes into account. You have to remember, there are a number of people um, because of uh, chronic conditions, uh, National Guard, uh, the the teachers, the healthcare uh, uh, providers, and so forth, who have already been vaccinated within those age bands. So we've uh, taken uh, some steps to, to make sure that we're being accurate. Um, so that's why you might see a, a discrepancy between the actual number, if you look at demographically, and what we feel is the number. So, uh, but, it, but it's fairly accurate. Anything you want to uh, add to that? No, I've got the numbers, but that you, you give off the website. Yeah, it's, it is on the website, the Health Department website at this point. And then one last question, maybe this is for Secretary Smith or um, Deputy Secretary Boucher, but uh, you mentioned that vaccine uptake and sign-ups for teachers hasn't been, you know, we, we still have open appointments. Uh, there, there was uh, that survey that went out said over 80% of teachers wanted it. So where, where's the disconnect? Why are teachers not signing up? You know, I'll, I'll try and answer that first and they can uh, add their viewpoint as well. I think we're still early. Um, we did receive some good news. I think it was close to 90% uh, uptake in terms of those in the uh, staff and teachers and staff within the education community as well as childcare providers. Um, so we need to give it a little bit more time um, because it's, it's still fresh, it's still new. This is only our second week now. Um, so uh, we need to give them a, an opportunity. So I'm, I'm hopeful we're not sounding the alarm at this point, uh, but we are advocating for those uh, who haven't signed up yet to do so, to look for those open appointments uh, so that we can get the, the vast majority of that 90% or whatever that number was in the beginning uh, who surveyed and said that they'd be willing to, uh, to sign up to be vaccinated, to be vaccinated. So um, I look forward to a, a positive result. Uh, Governor, given how the pandemic and the response here to uh, to vaccination and and mask wearing and all of that nationally is such a political football, uh, and people are seeing that here in Vermont, Vermonters are seeing that on the news, uh, reading it in the newspapers, magazines, etc. I mean, uh, you're obviously optimistic. Uh, how optimistic are you seeing our situation here? And how do you convey that to people here in Vermont that we're actually doing the right thing? You know, from, uh, from the very beginning, uh, I've given a great amount of credit to Vermonters for doing the right thing, complying with the guidance that we've uh, established. And we've been, 
a bit of an outlier when compared to other states across the country. And I believe that we'll, we may be an outlier in this regard as well. Um, I have my concerns as we move through the age banding, as we get to the younger ages in particular, uh, but we'll step up uh, the PR campaign. We hope all of you uh, will as well. Uh, and uh, because it's really important, as Dr. Levine has stated so many times, uh, if we want to reduce uh, the amount of spread, particularly with the, the variants uh, that we're seeing, the mutation of this virus, um, that the, the real answer is to get to it quick, right? Stop it now before it has an opportunity to mutate further. So that's why it's really important. This is a race uh, to the finish. And if we can get there, if we can get as many people compliant and get their shots in arms as possible, we'll be able to stop the virus in its tracks in some respects to keep it from spreading in a different way. Dr. Levine, anything? Couldn't agree more. You know, the fact that Vermonters have been unique throughout this, they weren't unique. They all had some pandemic fatigue too, like the rest of the country. But probably less so. Uh, but I believe Vermonters can be unique to the very end of this race. Uh, there's no reason why we should suddenly stop being unique. We did see some interesting data today looking at the fact that the Northeast is the part of the country that's having the uptick in cases. Uh, but Vermont was unique on the map of the Northeast in having the least impact of that in terms of uh, numbers of active new cases compared to the rest of the region. I hope we can stay that way for sure. Uh, so um, we've recognized the power that Vermonters have with this pandemic all along, and they have the power yet to go. Uh, since you're there, Doctor, and looking at the, um, at the time frame that we're looking at there, and comparing that with what we saw last year when, the, uh, when our rates started really going down, sort of corresponds with that? Is that give you some hope there? That's a tough question because <laughs> with the variant strains being sort of a wild card and with even the rest of the country leveling off it, it, small decreases as opposed to where they were before, uh, it's a little hard to, to predict. Most of the predictions from modeling that the CDC and others are doing shows continued improvement but nowhere near at the same pace that it was occurring in the last month or two. So uh, we'll see. There might be something about seasonality or uh, cycles of this virus, because you'll recall that um, the Northeast kind of had all of its action at one point in time and then got better, while all of a sudden the South and the West were getting much, much worse, and then later than that, the Midwest were. So, there seems to be some cyclical activity, too, that may or may not be scientifically explainable at this point in time. I'm just encouraged, to be honest, about the fact that the pace of this is so much, I think, more dramatic than any Vermonter might have imagined uh, in the last month or two, because usually we come to the podium and say, well, this is what we're getting in terms of vaccine, and this is what we can do with it. But now we can tell you very enthusiastically and energetically, this is where we can go. And before the summer arrives, uh, if we all continue to do all the things we're talking about and get vaccinated, we're going to really come out on top. Thank you. Stuart, NBC5. Uh, good morning. Uh, could we talk a little bit about logistics here? Uh, you know, it looks like you're going to be opening this thing up to, you know, three or 400,000 Vermonters in the next uh, month. Uh, how uh, aren't you going to need more clinic locations, people injecting the shot? Won't your reservation system be overwhelmed or are you adding capacity? What can we expect uh, to, to see? Yeah, we've been ramping up uh, to this point. We actually feel as though we have the capacity based on the supply we have coming in. Now, just remember, it's all about the supply. We feel we can meet the demand uh, and, uh, with the injections and, and the, uh, the, the strategy we're using uh, to, to administer this. Uh, so it's really dependent on the supply. Uh, Secretary Smith, anything you want to offer? S Stuart, the governor is absolutely right. We, um, of course, I wouldn't say anything different, uh, but the... Um, <laughs> 
the, the, the fact is, a, a few press conferences ago, maybe three or four press conferences ago, I talked about how we were ramping up our ability by mobilizing the National Guard um, in s several tranches, um, the last one being in the first part of April in terms of the activation. The way that we're looking at bringing on other pharmacies, Costco, Walmart, those uh, partners, the FQHCs, how we're sort of ramping up. And during that press conference, I said we're going to be ramping up uh, to the ability to administer about 35,000 doses a week. That's in line with what you're seeing here, um, is that we'll be able to uh, administer up to 30 to 35,000 doses a week. And uh, that is what the schedule sort of calls for. So we have the infrastructure in place. We've been building it for about three weeks now. And we feel confident that if we get the doses, we can get it into the arms of people. You got to remember, we're doing about 7,000 doses a day right now. Um, so it, it's not a heavy lift to go to um, what we're talking about uh, on this schedule. Okay. Uh, will the reservation system uh, open at 8.15 on each of those dates? Yeah, our anticipation that it will, if it's changed, I'll, I'll announce it. Um, but we did stagger it about a week out just to make sure that the registration system, you know, we've, had, we've looked at the age bands. The largest will be 16 plus, 16 to 29. That'll be the largest age band. But we have, um, we've handled uh, these sort of uh, populations before and we'll handle them here uh, as we move forward. All right, finally, I did get a viewer question asking if the administration plans to bring back the travel map in the spring that will compare us to our neighboring states and give us some sense about safety. Uh, is that coming back? Um, you know, we've we've talked about that. It won't be brought back in the traditional fashion because we're going to be, I'm going to be talking about what our plan is uh, in a couple within a couple of weeks uh, from now, as to how we emerge uh, from this, and um, so. But we've contemplated whether we should be, you know, utilizing the map to show uh, people where we we feel or you know what's going on in the rest of the region. Um, so we'll take that under advisement. But uh, we may bring it back just for uh, to provide some insight as to to where there's a prevalence of the of the virus and where there's not. Or bragging rights. Or bragging Thank you. rights, right? Lisa, the Valley Reporter. Good morning. This question's for Dr. Levine, I believe. On Wednesday, the New York Times published an article about COVID long haulers whose symptoms improved after receiving vaccines. Do you know how many Vermonters are long haulers and would the state consider including them in the chronic conditions category for vaccines? Yeah, very timely questions, Lisa. Thank you for those. Um, we don't have a good handle on the percentage of the, I guess we're over 17,000 cases uh, of COVID in the state that have become long haulers. All we have is the guesstimates of the uh, research establishment nationwide, which ranges from 1% to 10%. Um, so I have a little trouble understanding, you know, how to answer that question because we just don't have uh, good national, international, or local data to, to give you a firm number. Um, with regard to prioritizing them, uh, that issue has actually not come up because, as you know, this news about them potentially doing better after the first dose of vaccine uh, has just arrived on the scene. So it was never even a subject of our deliberations. We'll take it under advisement, but I have to say this is so preliminary, this information, and uh, I don't want to do an injustice to it by calling it anecdotal, but it, it really is somewhat anecdotal uh, that uh, I'm, I'm a little reluctant to craft firm policy around it especially when you can see the rapidity with which every Vermonter is going to be uh, able and eligible to get vaccinated. It almost doesn't make that much of a difference, uh, if you will, because we're talking weeks as opposed to months and months and months uh, separation between groups. Great, thank you very much. That's it for me.
Can you hear me? We can. Uh, Governor, you said a little bit earlier that normal to you won't be just a cookout in the backyard with a few friends. Um, curious to hear what you have thought about for guidance when everybody has been vaccinated that is willing to accept the vaccine. How long do you expect to keep masking and distancing guidance in place? Well, what will happen from my vantage point is when we get to that uh, 4th of July uh, stake in the ground, so to speak, um, is that everything will be somewhat lifted uh, and it'll be purely that uh, advisement, guidance, um, but uh, there w it won't be mandatory. Uh, but uh, there, I think we should get, be prepared. There are going to be a number of people who will want to continue uh, to wear masks and we would advocate that it, it might make sense to. Um, but, um, but I would see at that point in time uh, where the mandates will be lifted. Okay, thank you. One other question. There was, there was a lot of news being posted today about uh, three feet being an acceptable distance. Uh, they were talking particularly for, for kids in school. Um, but generally, uh, what, are your, what are your feelings about those guidelines? You know, I, I watched uh, Dr. Fauci, I think it was last weekend, uh, and he was predicting that maybe the CDC would be making some change there in their guidance in, in schools in particular from six feet to three feet. Um, that would be a bit of a game changer for us as we have talked about uh, previously. Uh, the, the big stumbling block, the, the challenge in some respects was uh, vaccination of school staff, child care providers and so forth. Um, so we've done that. Uh, that's ongoing right now. Uh, the next hurdle that we've begin to, begun to hear is what are we going to do about the distance? So if the CDC uh, comes out and, and uh, decides to go from six feet to three feet, uh, that's, a, that's a game changer in terms of I, I see no reason why uh, we wouldn't be back in in-person uh, in um, in -person instruction before long. Is that impacted at all by the fact that uh, that these registration for educators hasn't been filling up? Well, again, I want to give uh, give us some time. I mean, there there have been a number. What did you? I think did you say nineteen thousand? Uh, I think it was eighteen thousand. Eighteen thousand thus far have received their first dose. Is that right? Let, let me just get the numbers for you. It's, let me get it accurately. Yeah, it's eighteen thousand three hundred educators and eligible child care providers who have received their first dose or have made an appointment. Okay, so 18,300 uh, uh, teachers or child care providers have uh, had their first dose or signed up. So we're still uh, anticipating more signing up and <clears throat> being able to get their first dose. So I think it's still, again, a little bit early. We've only been at this uh, two weeks with the education system. Uh, so we need to give it a little bit more time and uh, and then we'll react accordingly. But but I, <clears throat> again, the up uh, the survey had said uh, close to I believe it was around 90 percent uh, were willing to uh, to be vaccinated. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay, thank you. Eric, the Times Argus. Yes, we got a call from a salon owner wanting to know when those businesses could see their capacities increase. Again, um, if you, um, a little bit of patience, if you wait uh, until the first week in April, within the next two weeks, uh, I'll be showing you what our plan is, and that will include uh, some of those uh, questions that you might be asking uh, now or, or those uh, readers who might have questions. So um, we'll be opening the spigot uh, even uh, uh, over the next couple of weeks as we did today with bars and clubs. Um, but um, but that will it will make much more sense uh, once we're able to lay that out uh, to uh, in, in a transparent way uh, so that you can anticipate what's going to happen over the next two to three months. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Uh, good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. Um, another follow-up question about the uh, the educator clinics not filling up. Beyond just the educators 
uh, the percentage of the groups that have not been getting the vaccine or the vaccinations. Have you encountered much philosophical objection to it, people who don't want it, or is, do you think it's just a function of not having been able to make the appointments yet or not getting around to it? Is this in the education system? Is Wilson? Both. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean both. Again, from, from the education system perspective, uh, the survey was uh, there wasn't much hesitancy uh, in uh, obtaining the vaccination, so I don't think there's going to be anything there, but uh, I'm sh I'll refer to Secretary Smith. Well, to, to go back into sort of those mature groups that have already sort of uh, had the opportunity to take the vaccine, uh, long-term care facilities, we saw tremendous uptake among the residents and most of the staff in those in um, the medical area uh, in 1A, we saw very good uptake. I think UVM had reported yesterday to me, and I don't know if it's scientific or not, but they told me that it was uh, near 90% on the uptake on their on their uh, staff. If you look at um, 75 and above, it's over 85%. If you look at uh, uh, 70 and above, it's it's going to be near 85%. It you know we're at 80, we're over 80 right now. If you look at the 65 and above, that is climbing up, um, and probably will be in the 80s as well. So if you look across the whole spectrum. Um, we've had tremendous uptake here in terms of uh, a vaccine. We've had some pockets that we, we've been a little bit concerned about, and Dr. Levine and I talked with um, state and local officials in Essex County to get some ideas of what we can do to help out uh, on the uptake there, um, and had a very successful meeting yesterday. They had some really good ideas about what to do, and we're uh, planning to um, double, redouble our efforts up in Essex County as well. So I, I think when you, I would hate to fo have you focus just on sort of the availability of spot slots in clinics, because as the governor said, it's a little bit too early uh, to make any judgment there. It's only been two weeks that we've had this uh, open and it's, um, and you know, we, like the governor said, it's 18,100 people that either have been vaccinated or um, will be vaccinated because they've scheduled an appointment. Okay, the, the pocket in Essex County you mentioned, is, is that a philosophical objection or is it a practical one of finding a place to go? I think it's a big county in terms of land mass, obviously. And what we've got to do is get what, when we talked to state and local officials yesterday, is the ability to, uh, you know, we had some clinics that weren't filling up up there. And so I think, it, I think it's more of the ability to communicate. And we're gonna be putting up road signs. Uh, I've spoken with, this was a, this was a um, recommendation from one local official up there, and I've spoken with AOT on this. We're gonna be putting up road signs that will tell when the clinics are and how to register. And maybe that will help as well. But um, those are some of the things that we're looking at. Okay, so you haven't heard any any communicated philosophical objections. I, I have you. not heard anybody okay. say that. Okay, okay, great. Thank you very much. Mike Donahue, the Islander. Thanks, Rebecca. Uh, Deputy Boucher, uh, one clarification. I think you mentioned 1,300 uh, plus tests and four positive cases. Just wondering where those four positive cases are and which schools have alerted their communities or will be alerting their communities about positive cases. I don't actually don't have that um, data. I would have to get back to you on that. I just have the overall data this okay. morning. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, if you or Secretary French and have somebody send that along in uh, case we want to try to do a follow-up question before the end of the press conference. That'd be great. Maybe, Governor, uh, Mike, sorry. Uh, Maybe Commissioner Levine can just, to your point about when the schools are notified, yep. tell you the contact tracing process. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, whoever these four individuals were that test positive, obviously that's known to them. That's known to their employer in the school district. Uh, they and the health department get together and determine how much 
and whose responsibility it will be to do what specific contact tracing around that case, um, if the case was even present in school during an infectious period. So you can rest assured that uh, it is not a community-wide announcement that needs to be made usually because it's only one case and it may have had very minimal impact on any of the other people living in this community or active in the school. Fully understand that, but also realize that it may have an impact on the school. So oh, I'm just wondering how many yes. are in fact, you know, but I'll yeah. move on. Governor, uh, um, Tom kind of went part way down the path about the three feet versus six feet, but I did want to follow up. Uh, earlier this week, it was disclosed that the national average for children getting infected with COVID-19 was under 6%. Presentation showed Vermont's average was listed as 13%, I believe. Wondering why Vermont is more than twice the national average for infected children. Governor, what is Vermont not doing that the rest of the nation is doing to protect children? I, you know, I haven't seen those statistics, Mike, so I'd like to at least reserve judgment until then. I will say. Um, I believe they came from Dr. Levine. They came from Dr. Levine at a presentation for human resources uh, directors uh, on Wednesday the, this week. It was I, forwarded to me okay. after I, that. I may, I may refer uh, to Dr. Levine, uh, but I will say this. Um, in terms of we do have a fairly robust testing regiment here in the state. I think many other states have reduced theirs, and we have uh, continued to have a number of people um, utilizing that, that platform, which we, we advocate for. Um, but, uh, <clears throat> but I don't know what that means in terms of the overall population. Dr. Levine. Yes, I did present to the Human Resource Association, uh, though we never talked about kids. Um, but I'm thinking back on our website and I think the number you're referring to has to do with the percentage of all Vermont COVID cases that have been in children, which may well be 13%. Um, with the majority of those uh, being in the 18 and 19 year old age range, uh, higher teens, uh, but I'm gonna have to, I'm using uh, my memory here to to think back on what those numbers look like. But that's probably the number you're referring to. And um, I think in Vermont, that number, if you think 13% is high, may look a little higher because of some of the nature of some of the outbreaks we've had um, uh, earlier in the course of COVID, where there were uh, multi-generational families impacted and children tested positive, though they weren't actually ill but that probably increased our rate. That's all I can say right now because uh, I'm, I'm going to have to really look at the number you just chose and make sure we're talking about the same number. Yeah, if you could send over the, your slide presentation that uh, you gave uh, those human resource directors that uh, had called me about those numbers, that'd be great. Yeah, sure. Uh, to look at them ourselves. Yep. Super. Thank you very much, everybody. And I might also add, um, Dr. Levine, if that includes the 18-year-olds, uh, when you consider the number of cases we've had in uh, some of our higher education, um, our universities and colleges and so forth, that could add to, to that number uh, significantly. Okay, good. Thank you. Chris Roy, Newport Daily Express. Yes, thanks, Rebecca. Good afternoon. Uh, just a few moments ago, I heard from a reader who would like to know once somebody is fully vaccinated, when he or she has to get another vaccination. Is it, they were wondering if it's six months or a year or exactly uh, when, when the next time is up. Again, I'll refer to Dr. Levine, but I don't believe that's been determined as yet. They're still doing the trials, uh, keeping track of the data, and uh, I don't think anyone knows uh, at this point. Anything, Dr. Levine? That's all. I think Dr. Levine doesn't have anything to add. We just don't know, and uh, and I'm sure 
uh, the CDC will be looking at that and providing us guidance in the future and, and coming up with whether it's going to be another booster shot or what it's going to mean. Okay, great, thank you. Greg, the County Courier. Thank you, Rebecca. Good afternoon, Governor. I uh, just wanted to clarify on uh, these new uh, or, or at least more concerning variants detected in Franklin and Chittenden County. Can you give us a better idea of when these people would have been tested positive? Are we talking, you know, in the last 72 hours? Are we talking two weeks ago, four weeks ago? Obviously, it takes some time to get uh, these tests back, tested positive, and then take take the DNA testing from them. Um, also wondering if that's attributing to some of the influx in cases, or are, are you seeing people, you know, not following uh, protocols, or is it a combination, or is it something else that may be uh, contributing to that influx? Dr. Levine. Yeah, all, all very important points to respond to. So first of all, um, anytime we get a whole genome sequencing result, it's generally a week after we sent the sample um, because that's how long it takes to get this back. The um, B117 variant, which is the one that we've become most familiar with, um, is being detected on a week-by-week -week basis. So that's real time, that's happening. The new one, the B1429, was actually from a sample several weeks ago. However, there was no requirement to report that result to state labs at that point in time because that variant was not considered to be a VOC, variant of concern. It was just another variant that people didn't think was very important. About 72 hours ago, the CDC uh, determined, based on newer information, that this is 20% uh, more transmissible and for that and other reasons should be considered a variant of concern. So all of a sudden, we got a report saying some samples that Vermont had sent from a number of weeks ago actually showed this variant, so you've been seeing that in Vermont. So uh, we obviously, right now, have sent samples very quickly to see if that variant is being seen consistently at greater numbers or what have you. Uh, so we'll know more about that either on next week's testing or the weeks uh, after testing. The other thing everyone should be understanding of is that we're literally sending 20 samples a week. These are not representative of the entire state of Vermont or even a county that they may come from. These are very random in a sense because of the sampling errors, but at the same time, they are very much targeted to be the right samples to send based on the clinical and epidemiologic characteristics of the pure person who had the test that was positive. So, we're really trying to make it a high yield enterprise by going after uh, those cases that we think have the highest likelihood of representing a variant. Um, but that doesn't mean every county in Vermont has had that situation arise where it's that easy to do and it's widespread through the state. All we know right now is in these Chittenden and Franklin County instances that the variants were seen eight times and three times for each of those variants. Is that clear? Yeah, I think that's a big help. Um, moving on, um, Governor, we had a reader reach out, wanted to know if a, a business could hold a private event or, or even a public event and allow only those who could show a, a fully vaccinated card to enter. And, and if that would change any of the requirements that, that they're required to, to operate under. Um, for instance, a restaurant breaking the, the six person per table rule um, or a bar that maybe wouldn't otherwise be able to open. Uh, and I think a lot of this is coming from the perception that, that the rules for gathering in homes 
has been relaxed a lot and, and may even be uh, more relaxed than if you were to go to a, a public establishment. I'm, I guess the, the question here, though, is can a, a private company say you can only enter with uh, a vaccination card and would that could they could they then change some of the rules around what they do? You, you mean in a workplace? Like requiring a vaccination yeah, card it, to work? Uh, in a workplace, in a restaurant, in a in a bar, uh, any of that any of that kind of thing. Can can uh, you know can a can a business say you can only enter if you're vaccinated? And and if so, does that change the protocols that they they have to follow? Yeah, I, I, that's one of those what ifs that I don't have the answer to. Um, I don't know if Secretary Curley does, but um, something we can contemplate, but nothing that I've, nobody's asked us this I, at, that I know of. I, I can take a stab at what I think is the crux of the question. Um, so you are correct, currently we permit fully vaccinated individuals to gather in a home um, and our business operating guidance doesn't open that up as wide at this point. And as the governor just mentioned, it's something that we're talking about internally to try to find, you know, the sweet spot. And so uh, I think that you can expect to have more clarity on that in the next couple of weeks when the governor rolls out the plan. Um, but currently, businesses don't have the ability to bypass um, threshold, gathering threshold uh, at a restaurant or in a theater, for example, um, simply because people are vaccinated, but it is something that we are working on. Would a, would, a, would a business be allowed to bar people that aren't vaccinated? Is that allowed? I doubt that it's, a, well, I don't know. I, I That would be for a lawyer. I'm not sure how to answer that. Yeah, that was the question that I I wasn't I was struggling with. I don't know, um, and we haven't we haven't been asked that. So it's something we can contemplate. But again, some of what we've um, we're going to be laying out in uh, before April one or the first week of April might clarify a few of those issues. Thank you. Appreciate your time, Governor. Appreciate your time, uh, Secretary Curley and Dr. Levine. WCAS? So, as mentioned earlier, the CDC this morning released its new guidance for schools, shortening the physical distancing guidelines to three feet from six feet. Governor, you said earlier it's a game changer. I'm curious if Dr. Levine supports the three foot distancing guidance in schools from a health and safety standpoint. Mr. Levine. Yeah, I'm going to try to answer your question completely, but with the caveat that this information was embargoed until 15 minutes ago. So uh, I may not have the most exhaustive review of everything that they've put out thus far. Um, but they basically did say um, that uh, a minimum of three feet uh, for children in elementary school. And if you're in middle school or high school, the same would apply but it does vary by the amount of transmission of virus that's occurring within the community. And I don't know the definitions of what low, medium, substantial, and high are. If they're similar to what CMS put out for our long-term care facilities, high would mean a percent positivity rate of 10% or greater, which we don't see in Vermont anyways. And that would mean that schools in Vermont at any level would be eligible for the three-foot rule. They also have uh, caveats in there about making sure that the teachers and the adults maintain a six-foot spacing and that in certain common areas like lobbies and uh, uh, auditoriums that um, this three-foot spacing does not apply, nor in the community and outside school activities that uh, students would be engaged in, in their daily lives. Uh, so we have been you know, looking for this kind of guidance for quite some time now. 
you've heard all of the compelling uh, discussions regarding how our children and adolescents are not doing so well, and uh, the better and quicker we can get them back into their in-person learning environment, the better. So I'm pretty comfortable with it at this point in time. There were three publications that they put out with this press release from the Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, which I have had the most cursory of reviews of in the limited time we've had here uh, with this being published today. And um, I'm going to have to really look a lot more rigorously at them to give you a more confident answer. But I do know that uh, if there's anything good going on in Washington now, it is the return of the CDC to its appropriate high pedestal, uh, not being a politically directed organization, but being a science and data driven organization. So if uh, Dr. Walensky and the rest of the team there have put out a compelling uh, argument and uh, feel committed to this, I feel much more comfortable than I might have felt uh, a year ago. Thank you. And Deputy Secretary Boucher, do you support it? And do you think schools in the state will change their stance on returning to full in-person learning based on this new CDC guidance? Yes. Uh, so as uh, Dr. Levine, uh, Commissioner Levine just said, we just uh, got this uh, immediately <laughs> within the past 15 minutes. So uh, what will happen now is we will get together, the Agency of Education, uh, the Department of Health, and we will look exactly at what those uh, guidance points are, and we will um, certainly be advising um, the field accordingly. Um, I'm not prepared to uh, weigh in um, strongly on that until we can actually take a look at what uh, the guidance particulars are. Um, but we certainly are supportive of um, students actually uh, getting back into classrooms um, for exactly the reasons that I talked about this morning, actually, in terms of recovery. Great. Thank you. Thanks. And again, I would just add, if Dr. Fauci, Dr. Walensky, and now Dr. Levine um, feel, uh, after looking at the information, that it's safe, uh, that gives me great comfort, and it should give all Vermonters comfort as well. Hi, Governor. The House is preparing its budget proposal, and lawmakers are looking to use a lot of the new federal money the state will be receiving from the American Rescue Plan. Do you think it's prudent to spend this money in the state budget? I think it's, uh, I'm concerned, uh, to be quite honest with you and blunt. I think that uh, we're getting ahead of ourselves in some respects. We just received uh, the inks hardly dry on the legislation. Uh, we haven't received any money yet. We haven't received any guidance on it yet. And uh, and our, we're already trying to spend it. So or they're trying to um, direct it in the uh, legislature. Um, so I have my concerns about that. Uh, there's. At this point in time, it appears to me uh, we should uh, at least figure out what the, the guidance is going to be. And, uh, and again, the Treasury has to develop that. And uh, we have some time. We do know that it's uh, more flexible than the first uh, CARES Act, uh, where we, in the first uh, package, uh, we had to spend or allocate all the money by December 31st. This, uh, this recovery package, uh, gives us about three years. So we need to invest this wisely. Uh, it can't be, from my perspective, uh, utilizing it for programmatic needs. Uh, we should invest it in infrastructure. And we know what our needs are. For instance, broadband, um, wastewater, water systems, uh, and so forth, uh, climate change initiatives, and uh, things that we, uh, we know uh, we had some shortcomings in the past. Uh, but with this uh, tranche of money, it could gives us uh, the ability to build a better foundation and, and to fill those gaps that we've sorely needed uh, in the past. But, uh, but again, I'm, uh, I'm a little concerned that they're moving that quickly on spending money that we don't know, again, all the details of. Can I ask, are there any particular areas of concern based on some of the proposals that have been floated so far, uh, are there allocations that you specifically would, would object to? 
Well, again, um, I don't know all of what they uh, are doing at this point in time. It's happening very, very quickly, like in the last uh, two days. So I, I, I just can't comment because I just know that they're spending money. All of a sudden I read uh, in an article, uh, didn't hear anything from the legislature, but I read in an article where they had uh, proposed spending money in a certain area. So um, it's all happening in, in real time and we just need to just take a deep breath and, uh, and we don't need a, free, a feeding frenzy here. What we need to do uh, is to make sure uh, that we're doing this in a strategic way uh, that will help us in the future and that, that we don't, uh, that we make sure that it fills uh, needs that we have right now. I think, I believe, like a housing need, how we know we need housing in the state, um, infrastructure needs uh, that, uh, that we've had some shortcomings on and uh, not put us in a position where we can't afford to pay for something in the future. So that's where I've, I've been uh, talking about this since my budget came out. Now, again, uh, I acknowledge during the budget address uh, that we were, we were using what we knew at the time and that we knew that there might be another package coming and we'd have to reflect on that and, uh, and change. And, and I think the, the House is in the same position, uh, House representatives, they have to get their budget out, uh, I think by uh, today. So they're, they're, they're ramping up to do that and uh, we're going to all have to acknowledge that there's going to be changes along the way. But, uh, but again, there's, there's plenty of money in the existing year, the fiscal year we're in right now to get us through. And there's plenty of money, we have a surplus. Um, so let's, uh, let's take this, uh, uh, let's slow down just a little bit uh, and make sure that we're doing this uh, in the right way. Uh, give us the, uh, the biggest bang for the buck, the, the best return on investment possible for the future. Thank you, Governor. Malia, Burlington Free Press. Dr. Levine, I was looking over the health department's report from December, which broke down the impact of COVID on BIPOC Vermonters. And some of the takeaways were that the community outbreak from June largely affected Vermonters in multi-generational households, as well as essential workers. And as you've mentioned, cases tend to be higher among younger members of the BIPOC community. Is the state confident that it can close the gap for vaccines among the BIPOC community without opening up to specific categories like essential workers? I'm just thinking about the community members who are at risk for COVID because they're younger, work in person, but aren't yet eligible or don't live with someone who's eligible. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, I don't know if you're in front of a television or not, but I would just look at the screen um, because really that tells the whole story. Um, we can really get through using this approach in a very rapid period of time, getting to the goal, the final goal post of really getting all those vaccinated who want to be vaccinated in the state of Vermont uh, as quickly and expeditiously as possible. Um, so uh, even if you're 25 years old, you're eligible to go on and set up your appointment one month from today. Uh, that's pretty rapid, the way things are going. And then within two months of that, you will be fully vaccinated. So I think that's the major message I'd like to convey today, uh, and that we will be able to uh, continue to uh, achieve our goals with the BIPOC population uh, by continu continuing to be consistent with this process. Doesn't mean we are gonna stop anything we're currently doing. So all of the efforts that are going to that population with regard to education, registration, aid with registration, appropriate um, access to the vaccine, special clinics that make it more accessible, uh, focusing on the multi-generational, which by the way, I'm hearing from around the country that no one has focused on uh, nationwide. We are focusing on it because it's a data-driven approach based on the data in Vermont. Uh, none of that is going away while we continue to do this approach. If Great. I may, Thank you. If, if I may take advantage of your calling me to the podium, um, I did find on our most recent weekly update, since kids have come up uh, as a big, part of the conversation today. 
At this point in time, children represent 20% of Vermont cases. Um, and if we look in a child means under age 20. 26% of these children are in the 18 to 19 year old age group. So just to provide some uh, grounding on the numbers that are being thrown around. Thank you. Great, thank you. I, I wanted to go back um, to the previous question about the budgetary concerns and the use of the uh, recovery money and uh, ask Secretary Young if there was anything that I missed that you wanted to include. Uh, Secretary Young has been closer to this issue than I have uh, over the last couple of days. Thank you, Governor. Um, yes, there is to the um, question quite a bit of allocating um, going on as we speak since uh, about Tuesday uh, in two separate vehicles, H315, which was on the Senate floor for second reading this morning, um, as well as uh, under consideration, as you noted, in the um, ongoing budget work that's being done in House Appropriations for the um, 2022 budget. Um, it, it, the understanding is there's about a, a million a billion dollars, I know I keep missing that uh, fee, a billion dollars um, of more flexible money in the state um, fiscal recovery section of the American Rescue Plan that will go to the state for various projects and some really exciting opportunities there, as you noted, for water or um, broadband uh, infrastructure um, that uh, we all know is costly. So it, it is um, something we're watching, but I, I think the goal is for House Appropriations to spend about half of, half of the money uh, in, in the budget. Um, and then once they get the budget done, to spend the other half in another spending bill. So, you know, it is concerning that it's moving so quickly. There's not a lot of input into the decisions that are being made. We hope that, you know, there will be a slowdown um, after the big bill is passed out of house where people are, are being more um, thoughtful about where the money is going and perhaps involving, you know, more, um, more public input and administration input at this point. As a reminder as well, we have a number of businesses that are in dire straits, particularly in the hospitality sector, uh, that could use our help right now. Uh, and that's what we should be focusing on because they will, we need to make sure they recover uh, and survive uh, over the next two or three months so that we can put people back to work. Uh, we still have you know, 30, over 30,000 people on UI and uh, PUA and uh, we want them to get back to work. So we need the businesses there uh, in order for that to happen. So it's all gotta be, it's all interconnected, um, but we, we need to prioritize and make sure that we're taking care of the emergency first. All right, we'll go to Liam, VPR. Hi, um, Governor, I was wondering, uh, when you might be easing more restrictions uh, around long-term care facilities in the state. I know that Dale had issued some updated guidance this week that I believe went into effect today around some visitation uh, restrictions getting relaxed. But do you have a timeline for when things might be returning to more of a normal for, uh, for these homes? Yeah. Secretary Smith, could you comment on that? Thanks, Liam, for the question. As you as you pointed out, we are updating our guidelines based upon CMS guidelines. As you know, the uh, skilled nursing facilities are completely uh, guided by uh, CMS guidelines, and we try to dovetail for the others what those guidelines are. The CMS guidelines um, are, are opening up a visitation, um, and in particular, talking about contact, physical contact, contact, and how you do that. Um, we'll continue to update as CMS updates, uh, but I think, you know, our schedule is dictated a little bit by CMS on the skilled nursing facilities. But um, we are, you know, we mentioned about three weeks ago how much we were opening up. We're opening up even more now uh, and also allowing things that we just haven't allowed in about a year 
uh, to happen. Now, there are protocols that are still in place uh, to make sure that our long-term care facilities are, are, are safe, but at the same time, I think you'll see, based upon what we have talked about with uh, various um, with the long-term care facilities over this week and the guidelines we're issuing now really um, start to uh, open up those facilities in a much greater way than they have. I will say in the next few weeks, I'll probably have an announcement on adult day and other areas that will be opening up uh, in, the, in the very near future as well as vaccination starts taking hold here in, um, in in this state, and it has quite significantly taken hold in the 65-plus uh, range. And if if you look at sort of, uh, we get slides every morning, and if you look at where uh, deaths have and COVID cases have really fallen off, it is 70 and plus. I mean, it is unbelievable in terms of the reduction in cases in that in that area. So. I think you're going to, you know, um, Dale has opened it up even more based on CMS guidelines. I think you'll see us opening up other parts of um, of those um, seniors, where, you know, the day-to-day -day life of those seniors in other, in other instances as well. Okay. Um, and a broader question on reopening. Um, one of the things we don't have a great sense of right now is how long uh, the sort of immune response from the COVID-19 vaccination lasts. And so I'm wondering, you know, as we look at July as potentially a, a time when things return more to normal, um, how confident are you that, that we'll be able to do that? I mean, at that point, people that got the vaccine first in December and January will have been vaccinated almost six months. And if um, you know, their immunity doesn't last that long. Couldn't we be in a position uh, of just seeing more outbreaks down down the road? Um, I'm going to ask Dr. Levine to, to answer part of this, but I just want to remind everyone we are not going to get rid of this virus uh, regardless of how well we do with the vaccination process and, and uh, how well we do in other regards. It's going to be with us for quite some time, um, but what we're trying to do is reduce um, the number of deaths, the hospitalizations, so it doesn't impact our way of life. Um, but it will be here, and it could uh, continue to, to provide for positive cases uh, over the next uh, year, two years. It's just going to be another strain of a virus. Uh, but um, we are, I'm, I'm confident in that we'll be able to uh, return to normal in, uh, after the 4th of July. Uh, but I don't know how long this uh, the vaccine will last. Dr. Levine. So we're talking about two kinds of immunity. One is really natural immunity, meaning you've had the infection and then developed antibody responses. And the other type is vaccine-mediated immunity because you got the vaccine. We saw some very encouraging data recently that's looking at people who actually had COVID and looking at how long their antibodies seem to be present. And numbers like six to eight months are now being thrown out uh, as preliminary uh, analysis of that data. We also now have vaccines that even though I agree many people in the older set and in the healthcare worker workforce got their dose in January, People who got their doses as part of the studies got them much earlier in 2020. So those are the kinds of uh, data points we're really going to be looking at to understand the duration of vaccine-mediated immunity. I don't think you're going to see a widespread campaign in the summertime to get people revaccinated who just got vaccinated earlier in the year. Um, I think it's more likely if you see anything, it will be discussions about tweaking the vaccine itself, especially the mRNA vaccine, which is a lot easier to do this, as I'm calling it, tweaking with, uh, so that the right immunity is given to the person. So if there's variant strains that have taken over and we're concerned about the fact that current vaccines may not adequately cover them or just uh, cover them in a way that 
protects you, but uh, you could use more protection. Uh, discussions and manufacture of those kinds of enhanced vaccines will come out. Uh, so it won't be a matter of giving you a booster to your immunity. It'll be a matter of giving you a newer type of immunity towards what's circulating out there now. And keep in mind, in July, uh, it is going to be summertime. People will be outdoors a lot more. And we don't see a lot of viral transmission in the outdoor settings, generally. Um, that's been uh, one of the nicer features, if I could use the word, of the, of the virus. Um, and we've really co gotten comfortable from a lot of literature and from perhaps protest experiences in this country where we did not see a lot of virus uh, transmission occurring uh, outdoors. So uh, that's all I can say for now. Thank you. Question of herd immunity. Um, one thing I'm also hearing as a potential note of concern is that um, people under 16 obviously still aren't able to get the vaccine. And I've even seen some analysis that indicates that the U.S. probably won't reach herd immunity until it's able to vaccinate the younger population. Um, I guess I'm just kind of curious how that will play into like the guidance and the you know ability of people to do things um, during this return to normalcy. Michelle Levine. I'd like to say it should have no impact at all because if we're doing all the things that we're supposed to be doing, and as the governor's indicated, these aren't getting thrown away, these masks, uh, because we got a vaccine in our arm. Uh, they're all going to continue on through uh, the spring and certainly up until July 4th, and then we'll have more news about how that may or may not impact our lives as the rest of 2021 uh, evolves. Um, but that's part of the reasons why everyone is going to be continuing to do those behaviors, even though life will be markedly different and I hope for all improved. Um, keep in mind that uh, several of the vaccine manufacturers uh, who have already had their uh, vaccines receive EUA or in other parts of the world receive approval are already progressing on with trials in those under age 16. So we'll have more information on that in a timely way, we hope, as well. Um, but I don't want people to, again, focus inordinately on herd immunity or community immunity, whatever you choose to call it. Uh, we don't know the precise number with this virus uh, at this time. Low ball estimates are in the 60% range, high ball in the 85% range. Uh, so the truth is probably somewhere in between uh, based on experience with other uh, viruses of this sort. Um, and we, you've seen the incredible uptake statistics that Secretary Smith talked about in our uh, 65 and older, 70 and older age ranges and in our healthcare workforce. So we'll have to see how that goes, but that may actually turn out to be um, much more promising than you might have imagined uh, as well. So uh, we shouldn't fixate on the number at this point in time. We should really fixate on um, what's going to happen in terms of our daily lives, our daily behaviors, our mitigation strategies, et cetera. And just to clarify, I mean, her, we, there's a possibility of uh, vaccines having an effect on COVID cases before herd immunity, right? I mean, since if 50% of the population can't get the virus, um, it does provide some level of protection. Yeah, I mean, every time a person gets vaccinated, that brings us even that much closer to much more overall health in our state and much more, I equate that with economic and other recovery in our state as well. Uh, it all fits together. But uh, you're right, even if the population at large hasn't reached 60 or 80% yet because they haven't all been able to get their vaccine yet, the people who have got the vaccine are still protected against the most serious outcomes. 
And though they may get a mild illness at most from uh, COVID while they've been vaccinated, uh, they shouldn't get anything on the more severe end of the spectrum. And keep in mind, again, that you know, we are in Vermont very blessed by having had such a low uh, disease rate from COVID compared to really the whole country. Uh, but that means we do have less natural immunity. So we are all going to have to be reliant on the vaccine immunity by and large uh, to protect us. Okay. Um, my second question is just more of a clarifying one. I think uh, for Secretary Smith, you mentioned that the inmates that have gotten vaccines so far, there hasn't been a change to um, the, the eligibility rules for inmates, correct? And you are not considering, you know, vaccinating inmates earlier than the general population? Yeah, there has not been a change, uh, and they will be vaccinated like everyone else uh, with the age banding. Okay, thank you. Joe, the Barton Chronicle. Joe? All right, we'll go to Avery, WCAX. Hello, is the state confident they're able to reach all BIPOC Vermonters uh, through these organizations that they're using for outreach, or might there be some that may not be connected to these organizations that could be falling through the cracks? I think the reality is that, that we are concerned uh, that there will be some falling through the cracks, and uh, we're going to do everything we can uh, to make sure that they get the information they need and to make the right decisions, but it is a concern of ours. Dr. Levine, anything? I would echo the concern, but we stand a far better chance of at least doing it with the approach we're doing so that we try to connect with as many as possible um, and hope that just like any Vermont or anyone else that we may not have been able to directly individually connect with will understand that they have a chance to be vaccinated very expeditiously here in Vermont. Okay. My other question is about medical waste. Is the state seeing more medical waste with the, with more vaccines, testing, masks, all of it, and how are they handling that? You know, I have absolutely no knowledge on that, except to say that using common sense, there has to be more. This is a vaccination effort nationwide, never mind statewide, that is unparalleled in history. Uh, so the numbers of gloves, the numbers of syringes, the numbers of needles, the numbers of vials of uh, li magical liquid uh, have got to be incredible. Uh, I would bet uh, some of the people in operations and in facilities management at our major hospitals would have some much more direct insight into that in terms of uh, even uh, pounds and tonnage of, of waste compared to uh, previous but it has to be more, there's no question. And then if you just think about our testing enterprise, forget about vaccination, um, that requires a tremendous amount of uh, PPE, uh, testing materials in terms of collections, reagent materials in terms of uh, the laboratory, et cetera, at volumes that are just unparalleled with anything seen in the past. Um, so you've probably opened up a little bit of a door to a a door that we may not have wanted to look behind uh, in terms of how our whole environment and society is dealing with that. But I do know that, you know, this is still what you would call medical waste, and there are very strict protocols that are adhered to with all of that. So I'm sure they're just being challenged by volume, not by having to change anything that's been done. Thank you. Hey, Governor, I had another question about another another bill going through uh, S-10, which you're probably familiar with. It increases unemployment insurance benefits. And the concern from the business community seems to be, well, twofold. One, it, it, it would take some money, I suppose, from the rescue money, up maybe $50 million or so. But the bigger concern is that it'll disincentivize 
people going back to work, and especially in those those jobs you've discussed in hospitality, et cetera, are you concerned at all that that um, the unemployment, um, the extension of the unemployment on the federal side, and perhaps even this bill could actually keep people home instead of uh, getting them back to work when we have you know a labor shortage already? Well, again, there's obviously some com concern amongst the uh, the business community about this. They've uh, spoken loud and clear uh, about what they think should and shouldn't happen, and enough so that the I believe that it put a pause on the legislation moving forward. And I don't know where it's at right now, um, but <clears throat> you know, seeing the chart we have here, uh, everyone who wants uh, to be vaccinated, uh, uh, 16 and over. We'll be able to uh, get signed up by one month from today, April 19th, and uh, we're well on our way, I believe, to recovery. Um, so, uh, as I've said, uh, having uh, the opportunity to go back to work and do things in a normal way uh, just opens up all kinds of opportunity uh, for us, more mobility, uh, more of a sense of normalcy uh, and uh, in, all, uh, in all fashions. So I'm uh, hopeful uh, that uh, there won't be a need uh, for additional uh, UI uh, in terms of uh, trying to keep people uh, afloat uh, in a lot of respects, um, especially with the $300 that's being added to the weekly benefit uh, today. And that goes on for quite some time. So um, if I thought there was a, a need right now, uh, and they didn't. We didn't have the $300 in place from the federal government. I might feel differently, um, but I, I think the additional $300 at this point in time uh, is uh, getting people through. Uh, but what we really need to do is get them back to work. Well, I mean, uh, that's that's a big part of it. Is even the federal extension could uh, uh, disincentivize people from, you know, going back to work because maybe they would even be making more money on, or a similar money on unemployment benefits, which are, you know, the federal program is going through September. So, um, and my, the bigger question is there a concern there that we can't bring people back to work? Well, again, I, I believe uh, that getting people vaccinated, uh, getting uh, people more comfortable with get, getting back to work in the, uh, in the normal sense is the key. Uh, that's the answer. And I believe we'll have that available to us by 4th of July. And uh, as a follow up to that, uh, it looks like the unemployment trust fund, the state unemployment trust fund has a, enough money for about 70 weeks. So I, I assume there's, you're probably not concerned about that. I, I'm, uh, I'm not, you know, I, be, I watch that on a weekly basis um, from the very beginning. And uh, it looks like we're out of the woods in that respect. I, I think California uh, had to take out a loan within uh, two months of the pandemic uh, because uh, they were underwater. Um, but we, uh, we had built up enough capacity. We had over a half a billion to begin with. And uh, we're down uh, around 200 million at this point. So uh, we've made it this far uh, over the last over a year now. Uh, with what we have, <clears throat> and uh, things are only going to get better, I believe. Um, so we should be uh, well out of the woods in terms of uh, of uh, making sure that we have enough in the trust fund uh, to get us through the, the following year and uh, the seasonal approach that we've uh, seen in the past. So I'm quite comfortable with that. All right, great. Thanks, Governor. Guy Page, Chronicle of the Vermont State House. Governor, an estimated third or so of Americans have either health, philosophical, or religious objections to being vaccinated for COVID-19. If next month uh, they uh, may be prohibited from eating, shopping, or going to work, um, how will you respond to their claims that they're being treated unequally like second-class citizens? Um, well, you know, I haven't uh, put forth anything that would preclude them from doing anything uh, that you mentioned. So I'm not concerned about that. Uh, again, uh, there may be guidance in place if you haven't been able to get vaccinated or ref refuse to be vaccinated. I know in the uh, health care, uh, for, for instance, uh, in health care, uh, there is a uh, provision uh, 
in, in some institutions where if you have in the past uh, not wanted to, for whatever reason, not wanted to get your vaccine for flu, for seasonal flu, uh, that you have to wear uh, PPE, you have to wear a mask. And that's been in place for a number of years in, in certain institutions. So um, if uh, we may get to a point where it's advisable for you to continue to wear a mask in some of those settings, but uh, we haven't we haven't contemplating refusing anyone uh, when we're out of this uh, pandemic. In fact, you know, I want to get to a point where we don't have to have the state of emergency at all. Okay. So this wouldn't be so much denying service as you need to wear a mask and social distance and that sort of thing. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm not contemplating that whatsoever. Uh, when, when we uh, get through this, I believe that we'll continue to provide uh, guidance and uh, advice on what you should and shouldn't do, and, and then it's going to be up to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, also, uh, H-167, the Environmental Stewardship Board Bill, would give some oversight over the Fish and Wildlife Board, you know, the Hunting and Fishing Board. Um, your thoughts on the necessity and wisdom of adding another board, the Environmental Stewardship Board? Yeah, I, I am not familiar with that at all, Guy. Um, I think uh, what we have in place, I don't, I don't, we have trouble filling all the boards we have now. I can't imagine adding another one to that, but, um, but we'll see. I, I, I haven't seen that. Did they get through crossover? No. Okay, so we don't have to worry no, about this. We don't have to worry about this year then, right? Uh, I, well, <laughs> this is legislature we're talking about. I'm not okay. sure, but I see your point. Yeah. Thank you. Colin, seven days. Yeah, hi. I have a couple questions about the, the recent moves to relax some of our restrictions. Specifically, I'm thinking of the unvaccinated household gatherings and then the upcoming um, reopening of bars. Um, Given our stubbornly high case counts and the emergence of these more contagious variants, can you talk a little bit about the justification for making these moves now instead of waiting until more people are vaccinated, knowing that the behavior will inevitably lead to some more transmission? Well, again, every decision we make, uh, we work as a team and uh, we rely on the advice of our health experts. And we came to the conclusion that this is the right point in time uh, to do this and open it up in a safe manner. But uh, we, again, uh, as I said, when you look at uh, one month from today, uh, you were opening up the last age band. Uh, and uh, at that point, all Vermonters uh, 16 and over will have been given the opportunity uh, to be vaccinated. So I think we're well on our way. And, um, and I think we, we have shown uh, that we've taken a cautious approach it's worked for us and uh, we should be able to benefit from it now. Now we're not like other states uh, like Texas and others who have just opened up their economy and done away with all the mask mandates and so forth. Uh, we feel we need to continue to have the mask mandate until we're uh, through the vaccination process. But I think uh, it keeps us all safe and uh, we feel, we feel um, optimistic about uh, and, and confident in some of the decisions we've made. Could, could you just, so I, I hear you when you say you've been having conversations about this with your health team. What is your health team saying that tells you that it's time to make these moves? Well, what, we, would, we wouldn't, the data, yeah. the we, we wouldn't do this unless they said they were okay with it. You know, we present this, we talk as a team and uh, they have the opportunity to say, we shouldn't be moving forward on this because we have grave concerns. And when that happens, we don't, we don't move forward. Is, is there an inherent acceptance here that we can we can deal with a continued 100-day um, average case count to, for example, jumpstart some of the economy or or help deal with some of the isolation that people are feeling? I mean, obviously this is a balancing act and there's a lot of competing interests, but I think some people are just curious as to why, given the case counts are still so high, that we would make some of these moves now. Uh, again, um, we feel as though our case counts have leveled out and that we're in good shape. Hey. Andrew, Caledonian Wrecker. Uh, yes, 
Thank you very much. Uh, I'm curious about the Newport prison outbreak. Um, facility has been in full lockdown for a little over three weeks now, but tests are still coming back positive. I'm wondering if you're learning anything about the mechanism of spread, um, you know, as, as to why it's still circulating despite the lockdown, why it's crossing between units. Um, and is it possible that some of the most recent cases uh, were uh, the time of infection occurred after the facility was put into lockdown? I'm going to refer to Secretary Smith. I think we have some theories, but nothing substantiated. Thanks, Andrew. What was uh, what is recommended when we have a situation like this is that you cohort, and that means you sort of those that are exposed and those that uh, have the disease uh, have the uh, virus. We cohort to sort of uh, to through contact tracing to make sure that we seal off sort of uh, any spread among others that aren't associated with those two sort of. Um, populations. And up in uh, Newport, that has been successful, uh, frankly. Um, the units where we're seeing the positive come out are those isolation units uh, where we're seeing positive. So I think what we're seeing is exactly what we thought we would. Uh, we were hoping that it would be sort of um, less than what it is. In terms of theory, I think there are two um, major theories, and they're theories. Um, one is that it did come from the outside uh, through, um, through correctional officers and that were coming in to, on various shifts. And the other theory is that it's being passed uh, prisoner, uh, inmate to inmate, um, mouth to mouth through diverted narcotics and diverted drugs, uh, medicated drugs that they have. Those are the two working theories, could be one or the other, or it could be both. Uh, can you explain the, your second theory a little further? I guess that's not clear. Yeah, there's, there's, um, there are some, um, there are some inmates that get um, what are called MAT, which is, um, you know, for uh, for addiction purposes, get uh, various drugs in terms of helping them. Uh, get through uh, the, the various to wean off uh, addiction. Uh, some of those drugs sometimes are diverted and they're not swallowed. Uh, they're kept in the mouth and then they're sold. And uh, that could be one theory. I understand. Uh, staying on topic, uh, I see, according to the DOC dashboard, there's one in-state uh, inmate that's hospitalized. Is that connected to the Newport outbreak? It is. Um, and that, that individual um, has uh, no fever. Uh, O2 saturation levels seem to be fine. But out of abundance of precaution, uh, that, per that, that person was moved to Newport Hospital. And um, uh, heading south now to uh, the St. Johnsbury prison, prison, they've been on lockdown and have positive cases um, among the staff with uh, at least one case coming back uh, this week. What's the status on that facility? Yeah, they have four staff people that are positive. I think one came back yesterday, but don't quote me on that. But they have four right now. Just, just to give you a, a sense of how many staff system-wide, and remember, we have over uh, 600 staff. Um, we have 11 uh, staff members that are positive today. Um, we have 41 inmates system-wide, 40 in Northern, which is the Newport uh, prison, and one in Southern that's been quarantined. Uh, that person was quarantined, came into our system, was quarantined, and was, uh, was tested positive, so remains in quarantine. Uh, as we move forward, but um, that's what we have system-wide. And, and, you know, when we have positives in a facility, um, we lock down the facility. Sometimes we do a full lockdown. Sometimes we do a modified lockdown. And what we do, um, what we do uh, after that is test, and we'll test uh, multiple times a week uh, to make sure that it isn't spreading and, and the fact that we, we've got this under control, and then the lockdowns are lifted from there. 
So is there testing planned for the St. Johnsbury facility in light of this yeah. uh, this week's stat? Case? A- absolutely. Or has that already been done? Yeah, absolutely. The, obviously, this was picked up on a testing. I, I believe it was picked up on the testing, but it, it, it's standard protocol, Andrew, that as soon as we have a positive in a facility, we start the immediate protocol for testing, which is um, pretty pretty aggressive testing over uh, a certain amount of time. Okay. And while you're at the podium, Secretary Smith, can you just uh, describe a little more your meeting with the Essex County officials? It, it, was that uh, spurred on uh, just by the, the low uptake out there? And, and who did you have on the call with you? And sort of what were some of the, the theories on, on why it's low uptake? You know, it's, I think I had addressed this earlier, but it's a big county, as uh, and it's a long county, uh, north to south, and um, I think, and it's a rural, rural county. I think there's just uh, 6,000 um, uh, population there, uh, so people are pretty spread out. So we have a te- we have vaccine clinics in Beecher's Fall, Beecher Falls, um, Brighton, and Concord. Uh, to the west, we have you know a lot of capacity in terms of Newport and Derby Line and the pharmacies on the west. On the south, we have St. Johnsbury and pharmacy capability there. But it is a drive. I mean, it's it's 30 to 45 minutes to get to pe- uh, people, and some people just feel that the the communications aspect of where these are and what how we sort of communicate. And get some um, gets get people um, cognizant of what is going on. I, I want to say this: um, it doesn't take that many more people to bring it up to the statewide average. It's a small. It's a you know the population is a fairly um, uh, small in that in that county, so it doesn't take a lot of people to bring wow. it up. So what I'm thinking, uh, what we think, and this came right from a local official. Uh, we're going to put road signs up there, um, th- those uh, AOT road signs that flash, that have uh, various information on where and how you can get a, a, a vaccine. I think one of the thoughts was, you know, make sure that it says free vaccine and where to go, um, which would be the health department website. So those are some of the things we talked about. And so that would suggest that you're, you're thinking or hoping that it's perhaps just a messaging issue. People aren't aware that uh, that the clinics are there and, and they should be signing up at this point? I, I think also, um, and Dr. Levine w- w- um, brought this up yesterday, is we've got to reach out to the um, health care providers on the New Hampshire side as well and make sure that they understand where the clinics are because a lot of people get their health care in New Hampshire and, and make sure, especially in the um, Canaan, Beecher Falls area, make sure that they understand when and where the clinics are uh, for those. So, yeah, I think it's making people aware, making healthcare providers aware. Um, you know, I went through the list of, uh, of how, many, um, uh, how many vacancies we had within the testing facilities in terms of uh, unused slots. and. Um, you know, we have slots up there. We just need to bring people to, to those slots, and we need also to make sure that people understand and the health care providers on both sides of the river understand uh, the schedule. Okay, thank you. I, I want to go back. Um, I know we're running late, but I want to go back to you. Uh, Colin uh, from Seven Days and his question about why I feel or why we feel confident in moving forward and opening up the spigot a bit more. And I, uh, I missed uh, repeating what we say a lot uh, in these uh, media briefings uh, about our goal. Our goal from the very beginning was to preserve life and keep people out of the hospital. So uh, when you look back, uh, we know, especially today, when we reflect on the 217 people we've lost, the Vermonters we've lost, uh, 90% of them were over 65. And those with chronic conditions uh, as well have been the ones who have been hospitalized. So we, uh, we just developed a strategy, our age banding strategy, uh, to take care of 
of those who are impacted uh, from loss of life and hospitalization. We're just getting through that. I mean, we're at the tail end of, uh, and you've heard uh, Secretary Smith talk about the high um, number of the high percentage of those who have been vaccinated. So, and you can see from Commissioner Pichek's uh, modeling uh, showing, you know, the number of deaths has decreased, the hospitalizations have decreased, and we're just going to have to get a little bit more accustomed to there's going to be some positive cases. It's a fact of life, but we're not going to see uh, the hospitalizations we've seen in the past and we're not going to see the deaths we see in the past uh, with the with the vaccine uh, that has been implemented, the strategy that we've utilized. So that's the uh, very foundation of everything that we're doing. And now uh, that we're opening up to the next uh, age brackets, um, all Vermonters will have the opportunity by April 19th uh, to sign up to be vaccinated if they choose to be, um, so 16 and over. So again, that gives us confidence in moving forward, opening up uh, the economy and the spigot uh, turns a little bit more um, regularly and, um, and we'll get back to normal uh, by the 4th of July. With that, no other questions, we'll see you all again on Tuesday. Thank you very much.